the words that uh, we sang before were so powerful. That, that I am a child of God. Um, the implications of that and, and the depth of those words uh, it is beyond any words that I can express. Uh, it is beyond any words that most of us can express uh, because it is so beautiful. Uh, that is the invitation that, that Jesus has welcomed us to because of the power of the resurrection of Christ and specifically of what he's gone through uh, this coming week. This is going to be an eventful journey for most of us. Uh, somehow around this season of the year, life seems to have a way of being put into focus uh, because this is Holy Week. This is a week where the emotional turmoil and the, uh, the emotional journey of the death and the resurrection of Christ all comes into fruition. And, and so when we sang those words, I am a child of God, uh, it, it pierced the depths of my soul where no words uh, that uh, I can express can suffice uh, the power and the magnitude of those words. And so I, I just simply want us to kind of pray and, and, and invite the Holy Spirit and, and really allow the Spirit to take over because um, God is present. God is always present with us. But it takes an action from us. And that is to acknowledge his presence. So would you join with me in prayer? Jesus, we welcome your presence and we say, thank you for being here, God. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you for reminding us that we are a child of God. We are a child of God because you have set us free. What powerful words those are, God. And they're not just an illusion. They're not just something in the distance. It is all accessible through you. And so, Jesus, we say thank you. Holy Spirit, come. We welcome your presence. We ask for your manifestation. We ask for your revelation. We ask for you to reveal yourself. We ask for you to remove all distractions, all lies and the voices of the enemy that tries to to cause us to not hear from you. And we silence those voices in Jesus' name. We welcome you to do what you do, and that is to bring change and transformation. And so, Jesus, we, we simply come before you and we take the posture of yielding to you. Say, Holy Spirit, come. Come and speak. Come and move. God, I pray for myself, may I not simply be a speaker of your word, because, Lord, you know, that's just so easy. God, I, I want the Spirit to do work in me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I remember very clearly when I was in the second grade, uh, in, back in the days, in the 80s, early 80s, life was different. Um, <laughs> into the second grade, you were allowed to walk to school by yourself. And we have came to this country not that long. Uh, I immigrated to the United States in 1983, and I started first grade uh, as God will have it, my parents were entrepreneurial immigrants that decided that it's always better to work for yourself than to work for others. So they work, my dad will work two shifts uh, in the first year we're here just to save enough money. And then, you know, the Chen clan is big here in America. And, you know, as the Chen clan, we, we usually help each other. And so my parents took loans from my relatives uh, to open up a Chinese takeout restaurant. And we went all the way to Ozone Park, around the border of Ozone Park and Brooklyn. We're like two blocks away, right? And I remember very clearly, it was the first day we were there. It's probably around this time of the year, too, close to spring. And my, parent, my dad walked me to school, right? And he walked me to school, just show the way. He said, remember this, remember that, because one day you're going to need to walk this path yourself. I said, yeah, no problem. And then my dad says, I'm going to come pick you up later. And I said to him, no, it's okay. I got it. Okay. Second grade, I've already had this mentality. I got it. Don't worry. 
And so, it, it, as with all new things, you, you, you begin to see the excitement and things. And I remember as I, we were walking, I paid very close attention to the streets. I don't remember streets. I remember how things look like. And, and so, I try to somehow remember all the little details of the places that, that, that look familiar so that I kind of have some visual points in knowing and recognizing I'm on the right path. And so, when dismissal time came and parents were picking up their children I said, all right, I got this. And so I started walking. We got out, I believe, at 3 o'clock. And we started walking. And then, I, I don't know, I was walking, and I was looking around just to find the right points and, and trying to recognize, that, did, did I go here before? Uh, did I go there before? And as I was wandering, I, I was wondering, man, is this the right way to go home? Is this the right path to get there? And I, I, I took a turn right, and... Next thing you know, it didn't look like what I, was, what I remember, and then it looked almost like it. So I made the decision to, to go this way. And then as I walked further, I realized maybe this wasn't a good idea. So I, I, so I said, well, when you're lost, just keep walking. Eventually, something's going to pop up that will cause you to remember. Now, mind you, I'm in second grade, and as a second grader, you're like seven years old, Okay. You're seven years old, and you're trying to make sense of where you are going. And I kept on walking, and I began to feel tired at this time. I began to feel tired, and I was wondering, man, did my father even went to come look for me? Because I began to realize the sun was beginning to slowly set. And somehow, all of us, I don't know what happened. I, I must have been God's divine invention, because somehow I recognized something, and I made a quick turn. And next thing you know, it put me right on the road where I remembered. And when I got home, I was probably almost close to about six. I wandered around for about three hours, and I came into the restaurant, because we used to live upstairs at the restaurant. So uh, I came home, and I walked in, and my parents looked at me and said, oh, you're back. And they said, where were you? I said, I don't know. I think I got lost. You know, it was all cool, everything. But I remember walking that path and saying to myself, I just wanted to get home. I just want to get there. I, I just want to get to where I want to go. I, I think most of us, uh, we have the same mentality. When we think about the way that we live our life, our determination is always about our destination. What drives us and propels us is always about where we want to go and where we want to end up to be. Right? That's part of life. We call that goal setting. We call that dreaming. We call that having aspirations. We all want to do that. But there's something amazing about the passage that Jesus speaks about. Uh, because just like us, the disciples were no different. They were more concerned about the destination of where they will be. And so today I want to kind of take a look at one of the, the, the final I am statement of Jesus. Yes, we skipped it. Uh, we're going to head back to the other one next time because we're not going in any chronological order. And the final statement of Jesus before he went on the cross is found in John chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles with you or look up right there, we're going to take a look at John chapter 14, uh, verses 1 through 14. It says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If they were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. <laughs> Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. 
How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I said to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe in me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, and you may ask me of anything in my name, and I would do it. This is such a profound statement that Jesus makes in the last I am statement, because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Most of us, when we think of this passage, we're thinking about heaven. Most of us, when we think about this passage, we're thinking about heaven. But we have to put this passage in context. In chapter 14, the beginning, Jesus makes a profound statement because we know where they're at. They're they're in the upper room, and this is probably the night before Jesus is about to get crucified. This is before Good Friday. So this is the night they had the Passover feast, and Jesus just washed the disciples' feet and says, I'm leaving. And now the disciples are going, oh my goodness, what, 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 what do you mean you're leaving? What do you mean something's going to happen? What, 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 what are you talking about? And so you can see the anxiety and the tension in, in their heart. You can see the, the, the doubt in their mind. And Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And then he makes this statement. In my father's house, there are many rooms. And I'm going there to prepare a room for you. And when I've done so, I will come back and get you. This statement caused the disciples to scratch their head because this is a statement of engagement. What I mean by engagement, I'm not talking about like meeting each other. I'm talking about getting married. This statement that Jesus made, he gives a picture of how the engagement process is at that time because the process is when two people get engaged in that time, they get engaged. Guess what? In that engagement period, the guy has to leave and they can't see the girl. He has to leave, not only because he has to leave to go to his house where his father lives and begin to prepare a place, a room. Until that room is built, he cannot go and get his bride because then the bride has nothing to return to. And so in the old days, what happens is they'll have houses, if if you, you know, I understand this because that's how my clan is back in the days in China. I actually went to visit my ancestral home uh, in 1996. And I could see there was a courtyard in the middle, my grandparents' house over here, my granduncles over here, right? They're right next to each other, right? And then our house right here. It was built right next to each other. And so this is the exact same picture of how the... Uh, the people in, in the Near East were, right? When Jesus says, I'm going to my father's house, he's speaking of engagement language. He's basically telling them that, listen, there is something so beautiful that is happening, right? This is my love for you. This is my desire for you that I am going to go to my father's house and prepare a room for you so that we can truly be together together. Forever. That we can truly be in this union. That we can truly complete this expression of love. And so Jesus was telling them, listen, what is going to happen next is so beautiful that it is like a wedding beginning to unfold. And just the same thing as the look on your face, <laughs> the disciples were going, huh? Obviously, they're all looking at each other. Nobody wants to say anything, so guess who needs to say something? The guy who doubted the most. My man Thomas steps up to the plate and says, Lord, (laughs) you know, it's great. You know, you're going to prepare a place for us. Um, We want to go where you're going because if you leave us, 
we're going to be missing out on all the stuff that we've been getting. Imagine the disciples that were all there. They all wanted to be with Jesus because of where he was bringing them to. Right? And in their mind, it wasn't eternity. They all hooked up with Jesus because of what Jesus presented to them and the destination that Jesus will bring them to. Take Matthew, the tax collector here. A man that wasn't accepted by society. But he hanged out with Jesus. And Jesus was cool. Jesus was a man that gathered crowd. And Jesus was a man that received applause. Why wouldn't Matthew want to go where Jesus is? The destination that Jesus could bring Matthew. Because wherever Matthew went, from a man who was booed, spit on, why wouldn't he? How about Peter? When you're uneducated, you talk like you're from no man's land. You talk as if you marry your cousin's sister, right? Which means your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? So it, it, imagine you're. You're that type where you're uneducated. People look at you like there's a few marbles missing in his head. Where people say, well, you're not very cultured. And whatever you do is fishing. And I mean, seriously, you guys really want to hang out with fishermen? You really want to hang out with fishermen? It takes me a couple of days just to wash the scent off my hands of fish. It takes a couple of days. Do you really want to hang out with people that way? But imagine Peter looking at Jesus. When Je where Jesus goes, the destination that Jesus can provide for him is one that gives him value for his life. Worth. Imagine that. So the disciples wanted to go where Jesus is going because the destination to them was so important. That's why Thomas says, Look, how can we know where you're going if you don't sh we don't know the way? The way th that word way is such an interesting word in the Greek. No, it's hodors, not hodor. Uh, <laughs> it basically means an access point, like a door, just not hodor holding it. Okay, it's an access point. It is the opening to a place, a destination where you're going. It is the journey, it is the path that you walk in order to get to where you want to go. And Thomas says, Lord, how can we get to where you're going if we don't know the door? We don't know the way. Since you're leaving us, you're not telling us. How, how are we supposed to know? And this is the statement that Jesus says. I am... The way. I am the truth and I am the life. Most of us, when we read those verses by itself, we're thinking about a destination. We're thinking about a destination. In fact, we tell people that we, we quote that when we quote quote unquote try to tell people to believe in Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. Truth and the life. So believe in him. Because you'll get to heaven. But Jesus isn't talking about destination here. What Jesus is speaking of is not about destination. He's speaking about the powerful relationship. The reason why he gives this image of an engagement process, an engagement picture is he speaking about relationship. When Jesus says, I am the way, in order for you to get to any destination, it has to go through me. You can't get to the Father without going through me. Because I am the way. I, without this relationship here, you'll never get to any destination. Without this relationship with me, this beauty of this relationship, 
you'll never get to the destination. Because it is the, des- it is the relationship that matters. But most of us, we're so intent on getting the destination. That's why we believe in Jesus, right? We don't want to go to hell. <laughs> Seriously, that, that's the way that we've been told. If you were to die today, where would you go? Nice, great open line to telling people that they need to have eternal life. If our mind and our focus is always on eternal life, then if we secure the eternal life, then life is fine. Right? If we secured our destination, then there's nothing we need to do. Hmm. If we live our life that way, And I think we do. Because that's the message that we have heard. That's the message that we have believed. That if the destination was all it is, then all I have to say is, I believe. I'm a child of God. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to end up to the destination where I won't be in hell and being tormented. But Jesus is not speaking about destination. When he says, I am the way, He's speaking about relationship. There's no way that you're going to get to that destination without relationship. What he's basically saying, there's absolutely no way you're going to belong in my father's house without relationship. Because marriage, it's marriage language. How can you go to my father's house and live in my father's house and act like you belong in my father's house if you and I are not married. If you and I do not have that relationship, Jesus says, I am the way. The relationship with me is the way. It is the access point. I am the truth. I am the way in which your whole life is measured in how you should live whether you live in darkness or you live in light, whether you live in truth or you live in a lie, whether you live in restoration or brokenness. I am that which you measure to. I am the truth. And if we live in the truth, then we experience life, not eternal life, Life here and now. Because most of us, all we believe is the promise of eternal life. Somewhere, somewhere, far, far away. But Jesus didn't invite us into a relationship so that we can experience something far, far away. He invited us into a relationship so that we can experience something here and now. You don't believe me? Look at the text. Look at the text, right? This is what uh, Philip says, right? Lord, show us the Father, and this will be enough. And Jesus says, I've already shown you the Father. I am the Father in one. I've been here, and I've shown you the way. I've shown you the truth, and I've shown you the life. I've shown you the way. I have invited you into my life. You have traveled with me for three and a half years. You have walked where I walk. You have seen what I've seen. You have heard what I've said. Truth. You have seen me teach you. You have heard me speak into your life. I'm the life. You have seen me heal. Peter, you have seen me heal your mother. You have seen me cast out demons. You have seen me do amazing things. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You have experienced it because you have a relationship with me. And 
And Jesus has the audacity. He had the nerves to say to the disciples, and you can do the same things that I've done. Because you are in a relationship with me. And not only will you do all the same things that I have done, you would do even greater. How can we be in a relationship with someone if all we care about is getting to a destination? How can we be in a relationship with someone if the relationship with that someone doesn't impact the way that we express how we live our life? If it doesn't, then all you care about is being and going to a destination. You got your insurance policy. Jesus is in your insurance policy. He's invited us into a relationship. And it's not about the destination. Because the disciples didn't get it. I don't think we got it. It is not until you and I begin to recognize that it is because of this relationship with Jesus we experience the destination here and now. It is because of this relationship with Jesus, we experience the destination here and now. Because we're a child of God. If we're a child of God, do, not, do, do we not experience the expression of being a part of the house of God? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's not speaking about a destination. He's speaking about a relationship. And the outcome of that relationship requires and demands that we did what he did. And even greater. So, when was the last time you lay hands on someone and they were healed? When was the last time you cast out demons? When was the last time you actually loved someone as God loved you? When was the last time where his kingdom above your kingdom. When was the last time when we said, yes, Lord, and not maybe? When was the last time when we said, I'm right here, instead of maybe later? Because the relationship demands that we did what he did, and even greater. I was at a wedding yesterday. My sister-in-law, who so happens to be seven years younger than my wife, she missed being under my watch. Because <laughs> when I came on staff at the last church, she just graduated high school. You know. If only she had a year with me, maybe her life would have been radically different. <laughs> but uh, those of you know who my sister-in-law married, um, oh, awkward. Uh, my brother-in-law is a little awkward to say, um, because you know how I carry myself. I carry myself with dignity. I carry myself with maturity with a sense of, you know, authority. My brother-in-law, on the other hand, hmm, I don't know about that. 
And so I jokingly told them Friday night at the rehearsal, I said, Joe, you're going to become my brother-in-law now. You understand the magnitude of that? I was seriously tempted to say, welcome to the family, Joe. You're my brother-in-law. Don't make me look bad. <laughs> but imagine if my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law got married because they cared more about the status of being a part of that family. Imagine if the whole wedding was based on the fact that my brother-in-law married my sister-in-law so that he can call me his brother-in-law. Imagine how ridiculous that would sound. Imagine how ridiculous it would sound if all my sister-in-law wanted to do was to marry my brother-in-law because so that she can change her last name to his last name. Imagine how ridiculous it was just so that they get married, just so that they can have that wedding. Just so that they can have that nice fancy pictures being taken. Just so that they can expend all that money. Imagine how ridiculous that would sound. Most of us will say, you crazy fool. Now take yourself and look at yourself in the mirror. Imagine how ridiculous that would sound. If all we cared about was the destination and not the relationship. People get married because of the relationship. Not the destination. Not the results it would produce. People get married because of relationship, because there's love. And they do things. They, they have the wedding as an expression of that love. Not just so that they can change their name and have tax write-off purposes. Not so that they can have double income and enjoy <laughs> the beauties of, of life and the extras of life. Not so that they can have somebody to go home to. But because of relationship. Imagine how silly it would be if people got married because of the outcome it would provide them. Because if they did, they're on a quick path to divorce. If you're Asian, they're just on a quick path of arguing. Imagine how silly that would sound and how foolish that would sound. So then, why do you and I take the words of Jesus when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life about destination in that relationship? If we say that if people get married because of that, that that is foolish, then why do we feel that it is okay? when we are concerned more about our destination with Jesus than our relationship. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. I, I come from the school of thought that says talk is cheap. I come from a school of thought that says talk is cheap. We can talk all we want. But change doesn't happen until we move. Change does not happen until we move. And so for most of us, we've believed that the destination is more important than the relationship. You don't believe me? Examine your life. Examine your life. In fact, that's what I'm going to challenge you. As we respond, examine your life. Look at the destination. Look at, look at how we are living our life and, and viewing just the destination that I got mine. I got my eternal security. So it's okay. I can do whatever I want and God will forgive me. 
I got mine. And what is the yours? Because it's about a relationship. And if it is about a relationship, then how have you responded to this relationship? Because this relationship requires that we do what Jesus did and even greater. Jesus was about his kingdom. It was about his mission. It was about other people. So are you for those things? Or are you just simply for your destination? That you want Jesus to be a part of your life so that you can get to where you want to be. And so as you are processing that before the Lord, you have to take an action. Because if we don't move, nothing changes. Then all these are just empty words that we say. That we feel a little tug, and when we walk right out that door, we forget as if nothing happened. And we say, thank you, Lord, I no longer feel guilty. <laughs> oh, that was heavy. But if you want to walk out that door the same, go right ahead. But if you sense that God has heard you speak, then it requires action. It requires change. It requires calling out the destination you want to go. And saying, I'm not going there anymore. This is relationship. This is the only thing that matters. And so as Dave is leading us in a time of worship, when you are ready, just simply stand up and call out the destination that you're trying to travel and say, God, I'm no longer going through that route. Your relationship to me matters more. This is our response. If we don't move, nothing changes and nothing happens. But when we do move, something changes and something will Some of us feel like the relationships in our life is the destination. We want to get married, we want to have a family, or we want our family to be repaired, we want it to be made right. Some of us is our destination for our children. And if these are the things that just consumes your life. Jesus, you have gone ahead. Things you said, saying, Stop looking at the destination. Jesus, here embrace this relationship. Letting go of things is very scary, especially if we held on to it for so long. It's scary, but in order for something to happen. The, king the groom goes and prepares a room in the father's house. The bride had a task as well. And the task was to wait and to be faithful. To wait and to be faithful. To be faithful to the relationship.
And so for those of you who are standing up, I just simply ask that you open up your hands. Visualize your hands as Jesus takes your hands. Just as if it was a wedding ceremony. And he receives you. And he says, you belong to me. You are mine. And when I'm, I am with you, when I am with you, you will experience life. When I am with you, you will experience the beauty of that life together here. Holy Spirit, we invite you to take over. We invite you to do only what you can do. Because no words can really have any meaning or value. It is you who are the agent of change and transformation. And we invite you to take... We invite you to take the lead. We invite you to break down walls. We invite you to motivate... We invite you to propel each and every single one of us to change. In Jesus' name we pray.